Why am I up here? Why isn't someone else up here? By education, I'm an engineer and uh, with a, a lifelong uh, uh, love in, of mathematics. And you're going to kind of see that come out uh, because that's where this is coming from. The untold story, how do we actually measure carbon sequestration in trees, etc. And what might be right, what might not be. Uh, a few of my uh, credits there, and then let's go to something that's really substantive. <laughs> Why uh, we should take carbon sequestration very seriously. Now, I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir, but I like to, and, and my, my wife Monica helped me very much with this presentation, mm -hmm. in terms of reminding everybody that if our forest didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. That trees converted CO2, carbon dioxide, into elemental oxygen for us to breathe. So we're here because trees came and made the planet habitable. Of course, it's not quite that simple, but enough. <laughs> and consequently, sequestering carbon, trees working to do that, is a continuing story, and it's important to mitigate global warming. Now, I think everybody knows that. Uh, so what's going to be special about this presentation? I have a question up here. Uh, we hear a lot about sequestration, and we also hear a lot of people say things like young forests or where it's all at. They're the ones that are really taking up the carbon. So ask a question. How do young forests compare to mature woodlands in sequestering carbon? We're going to explore that. How reliable is carbon sequestration information that you get across the internet? You'll see lots of numbers, you'll see lots of statements made and whatnot. What can you accept? What do you have to question? How do we actually measure? And we mean me, so I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to tell you how I do it and why I think that's important. Uh, the content, of carbon content in wooden plants. And then what conclusions at the end can we draw from this? Now, who knows about carbon sequestration? And what are they saying? in the newspapers, articles, scientific papers, on the internet. I find, and, and by the way, I represent this organization to a large degree. I do a lot of work for them, uh, American Forest. And I came across this statement. One mature tree absorbs carbon dioxide. It's more than just the elemental carbon. It's the full molecule. At a rate of 48 pounds per year. Now, I've seen this number a lot of times out there. And presumably, we might say, well, OK, if that's true, then I've got 10 trees in my backyard. Would I just multiply 48 by 10 and come up with how much my trees are doing? Not really. One 50-year-old pine in, on a good growing site could easily handle 115 pounds of carbon dioxide in a year. That's quite a bit different from 48. And if you, it is still in a good, on a good growing site, uh, by the time it's 80 years old, it can easily pull that much out. Now, we're talking about taking atmospheric carbon dioxide through the photosynthesis, photosynthesis the leaves, and leaving carbon in there. But the original amount of poundage wise of CO2 can be that high in that age of a white pine. Is that really true? Let's see. Well, who knows what? Let's go on further. Not unusual to find this number out there. OK, somebody may have rounded up 48 and said 50 pounds. I have no idea how they got the 48. I don't have any idea how they got the 50. <laughs> But you'll see that. Now, the people who are putting that out there are really well-intentioned people. They're really standing up for the environment. They may be understating, without knowing it, what trees can actually do. Now, why do I say that? Well, here's the US Department of Energy. And this was a study they did a long time running. Mary, you may have seen this a dozen times, a hundred times. But they went out and they took urban trees. They get planted. And then they tried, they wanted to figure out how much 
carbon was stored by year, pounds of carbon per tree per year, uh, by for they went up to 59 years. Now it's actually a little more than that because the trees that they're talking about were grown inside in a plant or something, so they were probably two years old before they were actually planted out, maybe three, not more than that. So let's look at a 38-year-old tree, and let's come across to a hardwood growing moderately well. And they say that sequesters 48.6 pounds of elemental carbon. Well, if you want to take that amount of carbon and crank it up to the amount of CO2 that came out of the atmosphere, you've got to multiply it by number, and I'll get into that later, 178.4 pounds of CO2 coming out. Well, that's them. That's not me talking. Now compare that to the 48. Here's the, what happened? Okay, let's come all the way down to 59 years, and let's go over to a fast-growing conifer, like a white pine. And they say that in that, at that point in its life, in a year, it will sequester 134 pounds of carbon. Now, a lot of my calculations come out pretty close to that. So these are the people who are right. The other are wrong. <laughs> but look at this. In terms of CO2, once you crank it up from the amount of elemental carbon, how much CO2 has had to be pulled out of the air, atmosphere, 492 pounds. That's 10 times what the 48 figure is saying. So I'm not shooting at the people who put the 48 up there. They really mean well. But we've got to understand how they actually went about doing the calculations. What does the 48 pounds apply to? Well, I went back. I didn't put another chart on here. But if I had gone all the way back to year one, and I'd come down to, let's say, through the moderate, no, no, I'm sorry, I did it for the slow growing hardwoods, at 12 years of age, they would have said a 12-year-old slow-growing hardwood would sequester 48 pounds. 12 years is not a mature tree. <laughs> it's a baby. And I'm not sure whether they were right on that because I haven't spent that much time calculating, but my point is the 48 must include everything to include an awful lot of tiny little trees to come up with that kind of number. Okay, let's go on. Two more typical points of view. When does a tree really put on most of its growth and absorb most of the CO2 and make all that carbon? Well, a lot of people, mostly representing the forest products industry, think and I believe they believe that, that a tree does most of its really fast growing as a young tree between 20 and 50 years of age. Well, we're going to challenge that. But that's out there, and that's a belief. And I can tell you a lot of my friends and acquaintances in the wood products industry swear by that. They believe that beyond 50 years, you know, a tree has done its economic job for them, and they would pass on and, uh, you know, remove it so everything can go back up from zero to another 50 years. In other words, they really believe that. And uh, we've gotten into some pretty heated discussions about that over time. But I give them credit for believing it. <laughs> now, other sources will say things, let's say, a little less dramatically, young forests growing rapidly and soaking up carbon more quickly than mature forests. That's what's been believed for decades. <clears throat> now, if younger trees sequester carbon at a higher rate, and we've got to understand what they might have meant by rate, are they talking about a percentage or some baseline starting point or what? <laughs> I doubt it, but most of them really know what they mean by it. They just utter it, they hear it, they repeat it over and over, pass it around. Because when I start talking to them, they get very quiet. And they don't seem to know, want me to know what they don't know. And I'm always very happy to oblige and help them understand. <clears throat> well, anyway, if that were true, it would probably, and you had, you know, your back 40 lot, lots of trees back there, and you want to do the right thing with the climate. 
they talk you into it, you might think of turning it over 50 years. You know, to start back again, because everything's going to be growing real fast. Well, it is growing fast, but that's not the whole story. Now, let's go from those concepts to a forest and see if we can apply it a little, just to think about it. And uh, I took this picture. It's a forest in central Ohio, south central Ohio, on the Ark of Appalachia property run by a friend of ours, Director Nancy Stranahan. We go out there, Monica and I, and I measure trees for them. And sometimes they wish I wouldn't come back out there because they've got more numbers. I can give them a whole, in one week, I can give them a whole year's worth of supply. But anyway, here, here we are, Monica and I walking on this trail. And it's in October, and it's a beautiful beech forest in there. And we come across this one tree. It's a chestnut oak. It's a big sucker. It's 12 foot circumference, a little over 100 feet in height. And it had a big crown on it. And the question is, from their point of view, wouldn't we be better off cutting that tree? Is that tree sort of senescent, ready for a geriatric home for old trees? Uh, and thereby release the space so that we'd have sunlight coming down and the little trees would grow faster because presumably this person here is not really growing anymore. It's just sitting there holding its carbon. We give it a pat on the trunk for having done a good job, but maybe it would be better off in their thinking if we cut that tree down. That tree has not stopped growing. There's more to the story. As uh, was it Paul Harper used to say, and now the rest of the story. <laughs> okay, but now we come, fast forward the clock forward, and we've got some counter views coming in. A lot of it started with some of the research in the uh, rainforest. I won't call too much attention to all this up here, just the punchline. Our results demonstrate that old growth forests continue, can continue to accumulate carbon contrary to the long standing view that they were carbon neutral. Everybody believed that. We were assured by it. Ain't true. But they believed it. And now they're sort of sneaking in saying, well, maybe we weren't totally right. Let's go to another view. Now, this is a deal. This is a really great group of scientists. And it comes from the Andrews Experimental Forest at Oregon State University. So there's all kinds of people that were in part in, involved in that. And here's what I'd like to bring your attention to. They had several hundred thousand trees that they analyzed in this, so it wasn't just a small sample. It was all over the world, not just out there in Oregon. Thus, large old trees do not act simply as senescent carbon reservoirs, but actively fix large amounts of carbon compared to smaller trees. At the extreme, a single big tree can add the same amount of carbon to the forest within a year as contained in an entire mid-sized tree. Wow. You know, that's a remarkable statement, but it's made by some incredibly good scientists studying lots of trees, and it turn, totally turns around our thinking about what the older forests are doing. Now, that doesn't mean that trees don't die. There's some point in there where a tree is not doing very much, but it's not what they originally thought. <clears throat> now, Monica, my, my wife Monica is, Anything that's good about this, it's due to her. I would have inundated you with stuff. She said, you got to throw some breaks in there. So <laughs> here's a break. That's the famous Granby Oak in Granby, Connecticut, white oak, Quercus alba. And this is my mentor, Dr. Lee Freilich from the uh, University of Minnesota. He's the director of the Center for Forest Ecology at that uh, school and I wanted to show him he's a family friend so he comes down and uh, we went out there now this tree is breast height there's 20 feet in circumference it's not very tall only about 84 feet uh, but it has an average crown spread of around 128 and limbs go down they take root and they go back up again there's a lot of carbon in that tree and it didn't get that overnight, folks. If we go back to 50 years, it didn't look like that. 
Most of its growing happened after 50 years. There's Lee again. We're up in the Monroe State Forest among what we would call old field pines. This was once an open area and pines grew back in, in the stand. And they are really cooking. They're, they're over 100 years old. They're about 120, 130 years old in those trees. Uh, again, I refer to Lee as my mentor. Now, let's go back to the hard work. <laughs> Here's my buddy, Tim Zalazzo, formerly of DCR, now retired and happily. And this is up in the um, Mohawk Trail State Forest. And this is a red maple that we lovingly call magic maple. Jared here, one of the uh, certified tree nuts along with me and my other friend there, Ray, he recently measured this. When I started measuring this red maple about 15 years ago, it was about eight feet in circumference. It is now nine feet in circumference. Jerry measured it to 115.9 feet. I think we will round it up to 116. And what's the story? Well, it hasn't just been sitting there, but this surrounding area is probably about anywhere from zero to 70, 75 years old. This was part of an area that it was managed by DCR and then DEM then. And we have this one tree here. So the question becomes, are all these trees back there growing so fast that this whole area, as far as carbon sequestration would be concerned, we'd be better off taking that tree out? Or maybe leaving one. But would we actually be better off if we had more of these? And that's what we're getting, or working our way with. So, the question is, what happens over time as we go from those young, seedy-looking forests that the timber folks like so well, and see where the carbon really is? Ooh. <laughs> That's Cook Forest State Park in Pennsylvania. That's the great virgin white pine forest over there, somewhere around 350 years old. We usually think it started from a fire in 1644. It is a wall of wood, folks. The tallest living thing in the northeast grows there, the Longfellow Pine, which we've actually climbed and tape drop measured. It's 184 feet in height. That's a 17-story building. And it's about 350 years old. It's still growing. Not real fast, but it's still growing. So the amount of wood that you see there, relative to that previous slide, which I go back, look at that, how much light's coming through, et cetera, the size, the, and then we come forward. Again, I ask the question, did that forest look like that at age 50? No, no it didn't. Most of the wood has been accumulated in the carbon sequestered since then. Let's go to our own state in our own county, Hampshire County. Where is that? Bryant Woods, coming to Mass. That is on the Pine Loop Trail, which I humbly say I laid out for the trustees of reservations. And when I did that, I had two Smith uh, College students to help. And uh, of course, my pathway, I marked it with orange flagging. And when Jim Caffrey, the forest, and was going to actually cut the trail, came back and said, Bob, I, I had to smooth out your trail a little bit. Well, all I was doing was just running to one big tree after another. <laughs> <laughs> My pathway wasn't too regular. He had to smooth it out. But again, folks, this is a much younger, much younger forest, maybe 130, 40, 50 years old in, in those trees. And they're still growing like mad. It's another wall of wood. Now, here is over here some of those pines in Bryant. And over here is an early successional habitat on Watay Mountain. It's aesthetic. It's pretty. I have nothing against it. It serves a purpose. I'm not arguing against having that sort of thing. And this lovely little child here, little red maple, is doing this just growing its heart out. <laughs> but it isn't going to compete with that. So the idea that early successional habitat will generate a lot of carbon I won't use four-letter words, but it's just absolutely absurd. 
Where's the carbon? Here or there? Well, I had to throw this one in because I'm going to do a presentation down in Simsbury, Connecticut at the end of April. And that is the great Gifford Pinchot sycamore, 300 years old or more. And I measured this tree for American Forest. Last time I measured it, 28.35 feet in circumference, average breast height, right on 100 feet in height and an average crown spread of 144 feet. There's a lot of wood in that side. <laughs> and that's common for sycamores. It's a big floodplain sycamore. And it's one of the largest, but not the largest, sycamores in the country. And it's been growing there, sequestering. Some of its limbs are larger than most trees that we know. So again, I asked, well, did he get there in 50 years and then just sort of sit there? No, it's been growing ever since. In fact, there's a plaque out there. The plaque says, didn't say when they measured it. It was, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that, 20 maybe. And it said, the sycamore is 23 feet around. Mm -hmm. They didn't say as of such and such a day when we measured it, because I don't really think they thought it was growing. <laughs> and so now it's 28.35 and still growing, it's a growing machine. <laughs> well, I can't leave out our own great Sunderland sycamore. If the Pinchot might very well be the largest tree in New England, this is certainly the largest tree in Massachusetts. Again, I measure the trees for VCR, and this one is now 25.8 feet in circumference. Monica, my wife Monica, is there for scale. <laughs> the, the limbs are huge. Uh, it has, uh, it, it lost some limbs. And it's now average crown spread is 134, 135 feet. It's 112 feet in height. I will, sometime within the next year or two, hopefully with Brother Jared here, we're going to go out there. You didn't know that, Jared, but <laughs> we're going to model that sucker. And, and I'll explain how we will do that and figure out what the volume of that tree is and figure out how much carbon that is holding and how much it's sucked out of the air, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let's go from that to a first look at how we might assess how much carbon might be available in trees or how we might figure out how much wood is there. We'll go to a forestry concept, basal area. Let's take a tree and go up four and a half feet and then let's see if we can figure out the cross-sectional area area at four and a half feet. And we do that for every tree within, let's say, an acre. And add all those numbers together. And that's the basal area, cross-sectional area, in some unit area. So I wanted to illustrate graphically, here's 18 trees. These numbers represent the cross-sectional area of each of those trees and breast height. And two of them are roughly the same, 11.64 square feet at breast height. And what's the takeaway from all this? Well, it's a pretty busy looking place there, 18 trees all together. Two trees make up 53% of the basal area. I find oftentimes numbers like this. And I say, well, you know, it doesn't, you wouldn't necessarily think that, but these larger trees have a disproportionate e effect. Now, if we want to go to actually determining the amount of carbon in a tree, we can't just look at a two dimensional view of it. We've got to go and take the whole tree. So what do we actually do? How do we go from, let's say, a, a view of how much wood is coming up at four and a half feet versus all wood? Well, we take, let's say, a tree, and we take the trunk, and we take the major limbs, and we divide it up into sections. Now, each of these sections, we'll choose them very carefully. We'll have a reason for where we end one section and start another. But the idea is that each one of those sections, we're going to figure out how much volume is in that section by appealing to solid geometry. 
For example, we might think of the regular cone. Everybody knows what a cone looks like. You know, turn with ice cream upside down. <laughs> well, cone. Or it might look a little different from that, be a little fat on the sides, and we would call that a paraboloid. Or we might start out and it's got big roots and, and the, the, the trunk very quickly narrows down, so the sides are concave. We might call that a needleoid. Well, in forestry, that's the three common trunk forms based upon the taper, how the trunk tapers. That's the three common forms that we use to determine volume. So to give you a little better idea, it's just a two-dimensional look. There's the paraboloid. It has fatter sides. The cone, linear rate of uh, narrowing, and the needleoid. Now, in truth, a tree trunk will not be any one of those. Usually, it will be a combination. It will usually start off this way, turn into that, and end up that. Sometimes you'll change points of inflection as you go up the trunk, and we have to take all that into consideration. And I love it. <laughs> I love it so much that I spent a long time figuring out how to do this just right. So let's say this is one of those sections. Now we're going to use the term frustum, because that's a mathematical term, and where a simple term would work, we don't want to do that. We want to put in some really jazzy sounding terms. So this is a frustum. Now if the trunk narrowed down very quickly in that needleoid form, the blue line is the outline. That would be the needleoid shape. And that would be probably where the trunk starts off. You go out and look in a field anywhere you see a tree and usually it bulges out at the base and narrows down. However you get up a little further up and the sides of the trunk may be straight tapering, but straight, and that would be the green line, and that would be cone. That would be what cone would be doing. Or maybe the trunk bulges out a little bit before it started narrowing down, and that would be the brown line, and that would be the paraboloid. Now, <clears throat> you can get to that one or the other if you know you want to treat the trunk, a section of it, as a needleoid then you have to define a factor, actually an exponent or a power, that once you put it into a formula, would automatically give you the volume based upon a needleoid. And needleoid, a p-value of 1.5, cone is 1, and uh, what happened to my, oh, there it is, paraboloid 0.5. So what I did, it, it takes integral calculus to do this, so you, you really got to be a nut. You got to really like this stuff. So one of the first things I did was I came up with a general taper equation, and that's that. And if I have this section, and I know I measure it at the base, you know, I figure out how, what the circumference is, or, or the diameter, and I get the diameter, take half of that, and I got the radius. I swear, Monica, I promised you I wouldn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> she normally has me on a tether because that. She didn't yank me. So there's the rate, the base radius. There's the top of the frustum radius. And there's the height of the frustum. And if we know those three things, which we can measure pretty accurately, and then we decide on a value of P based on how the trunk looks, then we crank them into this formula down here and we get the volume. That is just as good as our choice. If we made the right choice, the trunk was circular at the top and the base, we don't always assume that. We can assume it bulges out so it's more elliptical. Lots more formulas. Monica <laughs> made me take them out. <laughs> at any rate, my point here is I don't think very many of my friends who debate this stuff with me really want to do it very long because I find they don't really understand this stuff. So they don't actually understand how to go about actually figuring out how much volume there is in a trunk. Well, why is that important? Because unless you're cutting the tree down, sectioning it up and burning it or something, 
or, or drying it out and weighing it. You've got to get the volume right if you're going to get the carbon right. If you're going to get the carbon right, then you can go very quickly to the carbon dioxide. But if you don't get that right, you blow it. You really don't know how much wood is in that tree, what it had when it was 20 years old, 50 years old, 100 years old, etc. And then you come up with some strange numbers. Now, so here's just an example. So I said, okay, suppose the lower radius is two and a half feet, the upper radius is 1.9 in the height. So that's a big section of the trunk, 30 feet. If I said, oh, okay, let, let's say it looks like the blue lines, you know, it's tapering that way, then I'm cranking a P of 1.5, and that formula would give me a volume of 457 cubic feet. On the other hand, if it were a cone, sides are linear, straight, P value would be one, and it'd be a little more. Well, that makes sense because you can clearly see that the blue lines are inside the green lines, and the green lines are inside the brown lines. So, <coughs> wow. <laughs> we go through that, and we see the parabola that has the most volume. Now, one of the forestry rules, really uh, methods, treats most of the lower trunks as a parabola. Okay. Ready for a break now? <laughs> Let's just look at some nice stuff now. Now take a look at that. That is from the famous Oak Alley in Louisiana. This has been in many films, many, many, many films. It's historic. And here's my good buddy. He is an aero, a welder for the aerospace industry, very specialized. He's a good hunter. He likes to hunt and I corrupted him. The third thing he likes to do is measure trees. <laughs> Don't try to figure it out. He knows the owner of Oak Alley. And the, he said, wouldn't you actually be willing to go out and measure all my trees and tell me how much wood is there and that sort of thing? So we're starting that project. I feed Larry spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, in which he goes out and gets the measurement and plugs the numbers in. But this is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So there's Oak Alley. These are live oaks, by the way. And a lot of people think that's a thousand-year-old tree. No, they're much younger than you think. 300 to 400 old. Mm -hmm. Two to 400 is, is a fairly good rate. Growth rate worldwide. real wide. That is our famous Sahida Pine in Long Trail State Forest. That is the second tallest living thing we know of in New England. Measured last year, 171.4 feet. Circumference at chest height, 12 feet. It has about 825 cubic feet of wood in the trunk. And how much carbon does it sequester per year? Well, maybe in one year, 329, something like 321 pounds of CO2. 321. A lot more than 48. <laughs> but this is a, a treasure. You know, and I've taken lots of people to see these trees, and I try to gauge how they look at them. Do they or would they have thought that tree was that big or that tall or anything like that? I'm trying to get into the heads of people who make horrendous mistakes in how much a tree like that has. But they don't all. I had a friend by the name of Carl Davies. He was a forester for um, Northampton watershed, et cetera. Carl's a good guy, really a good guy. We, we went out there one day, and I said, Carl, you know, strictly from a commercial standpoint, how much, how many board feet you, well, he stepped back and he looked at it. He said, I think 5,000. You know, he was, by every calculation I'd come up with, if you assume that 50% of the wood you get is usable, in other words, there was over 10,000 uh, board feet, but if you consider 50% is usable, 5,000. I think it was right on the money. Most people I take in there just look at it, and their jaws drop. <laughs> and then they become very silent because they have no idea. They're not accustomed to seeing trees like this or having any idea how they got to be that size. Ah, well, there's my beautiful wife next to the grandmother tree, which is about a 350-year-old white pine in packed forest up in the Adirondacks. 
And this is a very famous tree in, in so far as that. I measured this tree for State University of New York, SUNY. They had mismeasured it by 36 feet. And we kept that a secret. But if I'm good at anything, I'm good at measuring these. <laughs> we got it down at a broken top. It was 155 feet in height just before the broken top. It was 14.2 feet in circumference, roughly, right there. Oh, it had over 900 cubic feet in the trunk. So you had to have to add another 10 or 12 percent to the limbs. There's a lot of wood there. Yes? Detail, but how did you determine right there on a tree like that? Mm -hmm. How do you determine four and a half feet when it's uh, I, I'll do it from all sides. And, and call it four and a half feet and then take a, 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 an average of, you know, that's basically what I do. Uh, if, if it's on level ground, there's not, but usually when it's on sloping ground, I've got to take multiple measurements. Now, what in earth is that? Well, this is right behind our house. And that is the top of the Monica tulip tree. And Monica, lovely well, she swears that I only married her for her trees, and that is not true. <laughs> but we wanted to see, and she wanted to see, what the uh, tulip tree blossoms. They're not showing up here very well. So our good buddy, filmmaker and naturalist, Ray Aslan, brought his quadcopter out and flew it over this tree so we could see the blossoms. And if you had the right light, we would have seen them better. But there was a lot of, a lot of blossoms up there. It's a 120 foot tall tulip tree, about 90 years old and about a seven foot circumference. And it's in a forest environment, so it's being growing up. <clears throat> and all around it is a mature forest, roughly 100 years old, 100, 110. It's probably the most measured forest on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to know what the tulip tree saw. And that's what it sees. And there's the Mount Tom Range, Connecticut River going through in the Holyoke Range, and a fairly mature woodland all in between with lots of white pines and whatnot in the 100 to 110, 150 year old age range. I'm measuring them constantly. They have not stopped growing, folks. So I say that, I'm trying to plant some numbers. The 50 year old idea of 20 to 50 is absurd. I swore I wouldn't say th bad things. <laughs> but a lot of well-meaning, well-intentioned forest managers think that once a forest gets up to about 100 years, it just starts <coughs> meandering around. I've done my job. I'm ready for retirement. Yeah. It's, I'm over the hill. Folks, they don't have a clue. <laughs> so how do we know all this stuff? Well. My wife is a retired professor of music from Smith College. She collects pianos. So she allows me to collect things like that. Mm. <laughs> and this is one of the instruments I use to measure the diameter of a tree up above the ground where I can't get to it. And it's called an RD-1000. It comes from Laser Tech out in Colorado. And Monica bought it for me. And my first birthday present from her is a not bad, $1,500. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> she wants me to be outfitted with all the right instruments. She's my biggest supporter. And I, I do measurements and, and, and communicate with laser tech out there to sort of do field testing of some of the instruments and push them to their limits. This one is a laser measuring device, as they would call it. One of the things it does is measure tree height. That would make it a hypsometer or hypsometer if you prefer. It is accurate to about uh, four inches, three to four inches. So you're measuring something way up there and you can get that close. Now, I didn't bring in, I didn't bring Sparky, which is a later model. I named these instruments. I tried to convince Monica that when I got Sparky, that can measure accurately to plus or minus about two centimeters. That sparking might get cold at night. I might need to snuggle up to us, but 
<laughs> I can win that one. Sparky has his place. <laughs> this one is a monocular with a reticle across the lens. And it is unbelievably accurate. If I get the distance to the trunk right, then I have this reticle that goes over. I see the trunk through this reticle. It's a scale, and I can count up the little pink marks and figure out how wide the trunk is at that point. I'm off maybe a quarter to a half an inch at 200 feet up. So I can actually go beyond measuring just the width of the trunk. I can measure the length of the growing candle on a white pine. This is an old-fashioned diameter tape, D tape as we call it, so you want to put a tape around the trunk, and it measures one side the circumference and the other's diameter. Since I'm not going to mention any names, I will simply tell you something I find very funny. I was out with a couple of foresters one time in Mohawk Trail State Forest, and I'd forgotten the detail. And uh, I took just a regular cloth tape, and I said, well, I'm going to get the, the diameter out of this. And uh, they wondered if my circumference measurement would give them what the diameter tape measurement did if I divided that circumference by pi. And I thought, that is an obvious. <laughs> Don't you understand how a diameter tape is made? That one side is scaled in units of pi? They didn't. And then I started finding out that a lot of people who do a lot of throwing numbers around sometimes know surprisingly little. This is a clinometer, and that was really an instrument. It's all mechanical, there's nothing electronic in it. And it was made to measure tree height. It has a scale in there, one scale will do angle. So you measure the angle, vertical angle of a point, such at the top of the tree. I often use it <clears throat> just to demonstrate or teach people. But it's accurate to however well you can read it. Maybe if you're really good, a quarter, somewhere between a quarter and a half a degree. This one's accurate about a tenth of a degree. How do we put these instruments to work? Well, there I am. You can recognize me. <laughs> and I'm going to model this tree. So I've identified, let's say, a frustum, a section. This is the top of it, and this is the bottom of it, so I have to get the height of the thrust. So I take my hypsometer, and I'm standing there, and I shoot, it's an infrared laser, so it's harmless to the eye, and I shoot this point up there, and it gives me the height above my eye level of that point. And then I shoot down here to the bottom of the thrust, I'm going to call that, and that gives me the height of that point above my eye level. So now I can figure out from the two how much vertical space there is in between, and that's the height. Well, how would I actually do it? I would use a, a, a formula, Trigon trigonometry, the sine function times the actual distance from my eye to the point, etc. People are always wondering why I'm subtracting the two, because angles below eye level are in negative, in negative and negative is positive. Monica's going to spank me. <laughs> I swore I wouldn't do this. At any rate, trigonometry figures into everything we do. Geometry, algebra trigonometry, and calculus through integral calculus. That's how we come up with this stuff. With that other instrument, which I, is, was the binocular with a reticle, I look through it and I see this, and I want to get the width of the trunk, width meaning diameter at that point. And I'll read a scale, scales across the trunk. And whatever that number is would be the value of the variable m. And l is just my distance from the eye to the front of the trunk, the middle of the front of the trunk. And then with each of these instruments comes a factor from the manufacturer that's unique to that particular brand, and so that's the F. So I came through and I, in the original 
the original formula that they give you with the instrument would not have this factor there. And I figured it out, well, okay, but my distance going up to that point hits the trunk before it meets that width line that's in the center of the trunk. So actually the distance is wrong because really what you're talking about is the line from your eye to the center of the line that you're measuring and you don't get that out of that. So I worked it out trigon trigonometrically and I sent it to my friends in uh, California that, use a, that measure the redwoods and I became a very popular fellow there because they, all of them could have done this, they just weren't thinking about it. Now, I come back to this a second, just to say that this is from the instruments, I would get H, I had a formula, I had a subscript in there, uh, and then widths, which would convert to radius, and then that original formula that gave me volume. Now, let's take a break and look at some trees. <laughs> what about the oldest trees in Massachusetts? This <coughs> courtesy of my friend Ray here, who got permission from uh, the owner. It's a private location, we cannot divulge it. But my good friend, Dr. David Orwing from Harvard Forest, dated one of those trees is 537 years old. That is the oldest accurately dated tree we know of in Massachusetts. Doesn't mean there isn't another one in there, maybe a little older, but black ones do that. We had one in uh, near Concord, New Hampshire, that the uh, uh, state dated up there, Dan Sperduno, and it was over almost 700 years. And as such, it was the oldest accurately dated hardwood that we knew of in the East. A lot of people, again, think some of those. Southern live oaks are 1,500 years. They aren't. <laughs> and there is sweetie pie next to a very large tree, tulip poplar, Liriodendron tulipifera, on the James Madison estate, Montpelier, in Virginia. James Madison loved his trees, and he set this woodland aside. He had a conservation gene. And we went down there and I measured the trees for Montpelier and gave them a long list and that was for their landmark forest. And uh, I was trying to set the record for Virginia and uh, I'd come up with, a, I think, a little over 160 feet for that tree. <clears throat> My partner, Will Bozan, beat me by eight feet and I found one, 168. Now, remember, that same species is that tulip tree in a park yard because the northeastern limit of the range of the tulip poplar is in that area, up to Wakeley spot here and there, but that gives me the opportunity to measure it and see how it does at an extreme boundary. We do that all over the eastern United States. We try to plot the growth capability of all these species that we study. You know, and, and, and there's some real surprises. I just love this place. That's Look Park, our Look Park in Northampton, and that is the uh, totem pole that's there. And I've been keeping track of a tree for the, the park there. It's now 141 feet in height, and it's probably about 130 years old or something like that. And I like to keep in mind that park trees sequester carbon too, and they can grow very, very rapidly. And so this is one of the sites that I keep tabs on. But it's just a beautiful stand of trees. <coughs> well, let's see now, what could I mean by this? <coughs> I wanted to <coughs> reinforce now something. One larger tree versus a smaller tree in terms of volume. 
This is white pine that we named after our friend Kiara Perkins, who's a retired mother superior out in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. And Kiara's pine is virtually perfect. Kiara's virtually perfect. Mm -hmm. Little hemlock, 10 inches in diameter. Do the math, we come out, it takes 27 of these to equal one of those. And it's not a slow, slow growing hemlock. It was 67 feet in height. But if you can imagine, okay, now let's, that's one tree versus another tree, but how does it all fit together when we consider area? If we took 27 of these hemlocks of that size and treated them, let's say, like a plantation, we're going to plant them in rows and columns. This would be each tree, based on its crown area, would take up roughly that much space on the ground. You know, this is a projection of the crown size down to the ground. This would be the area occupied by the pine. Now you can fit <coughs> several of those, to be more precise, 3.4 pines in the same space that you have the 27 hemlocks. Remember, it takes 27 of the hemlocks to equal one of the pine, but we can get 3.4 of a pine in the same space that we would have if we planted all those hemlocks in that fashion. So you can see one big tree doesn't occupy that much space, and it has a huge multiplier effect. I don't think that was very obvious. It wasn't obvious to me. I, I mean, I may sound a little bit uh, arrogant at times, but, but I get humbled often when I'm, oh wow, I would have never have thought of that. So this was the slide I put in this morning. I was hard at work for everybody rather than <laughs> this morning. Now, okay, the point I want everybody to firmly accept, grasp, accept, if you don't get the volume right, you're out of the picture. If you want to say how much carbon is in that tree over there, and you're using some wild guesstimate from the other side of the garden, <laughs> you're going to come up with wrong numbers. Maybe they're high, maybe they're low, who the heck knows? But if you get the volume right, then we can go and figure out the carbon part. So let's take a pine log here. Let's say they did three cubic feet. Takes up three cubic feet. <laughs> Now, in order to go all the way through this thing, we have to go back to physics and consider mass, volume, and density. And mass, I think everybody knows, is just the amount of material. It's the average. It's the material that's there. They take up a lot of space, may take up a little bit of space, but it's the amount of material, mass. When we go from mass to density, we're, we're figuring out, well, how much space, volume, did that much mass take up? And so we have to figure it out on a per unit volume basis, like a cubic foot or a cubic meter or whatever. I can convert all that stuff to metric if we're dealing in the scientific world, but most of my forestry friends deal in imperial units. So when it comes to that, and most everybody else does, I, I use uh, imperial units. Now, we know that pine, if we take a cubic foot of pine, for example, green wood, there's a lot of water in it. So the first thing that they started doing way back, I don't know, 1930s or whatnot, was figure out what the total dry weight of these uh, various species were, pine, poplar, oak, etc. So if you drive, you drive off the water, then you get the residue is mass without the water, and they came up with 25 pounds per cubic foot. That's the density of pine. Um, <clears throat> some other um, sycamore is about 38. Uh, some of the oaks are up in the 40s. Uh, hop horn beans 50, 49 or 50. Now, bear in mind that <clears throat> there was also a way of, they wanted to determine the amount of carbon in very dry wood, they might also kill dried. But then what happens is they found out that they drive away some of the compounds that have carbon, so they actually lose some carbon when they kill dry. 
So if you're using these factors of density, you might find one of 21 pounds per cubic foot for a pine, and that number would have represented kiln-dried pine. But some of that difference also drove away some of the carbon atoms. So if you want to do the best you can, you take the dry weight, air dried. So there it is. Now, if we then get that water out, we have the mass, and how do we gauge mass or determine what we use its weight? That's, that's the measure to represent the mass. Suppose we know for dry, for wood, for example, what percentage of dry weight typically is just carbon. We do that, and we do it for different species, and the number varies a little. 50% is a good average. A lot of people use it, and it's a pretty good number for white pine. So 50% of 75 pounds is 37 and a half pounds, and that would be the amount of elemental carbon, carbon atoms, in that amount of wood. Now, that's how much carbon has been sequestered. Oftentimes, we, all, we hear that what we're, doing, what we, we're talking about not the carbon itself, but the carbon dioxide taken out of the atmosphere to give you that much elemental carbon. And there, we have to do a little bit of mental gymnastics. We multiply the carbon, pure carbon mass, by 3.67, and that raises it to the amount of carbon dioxide had to be pulled out of there to leave that much residue of carbon in the trunk. That number you can take to the bank because, we go back to chemistry, and we said, where does the 3.67 come from? Well, we take a carbon dioxide molecule. It has two atoms of oxygen, and it has one of carbon. We can take their atomic weights. This is pretty close. It's not exactly the exact atomic weight, but it's close enough. So one oxygen atom, 16, one carbon atom, 12. So if we have a carbon molecule, we have two oxygen atoms in it worth 32. One carbon atom worth 12, add them up, there's 44. So the carbon molecule is 44. And that leaves you with 12 deposited in the trunk of the tree. Therefore, if we came out and we got some weight of pure elemental carbon, we simply have to multiply it by 3.67, and that cranks it up to the amount of carbon dioxide brought out of the air to make that. Monica said, give him a picture, and the little person there with his eyes looking at us, <laughs> that was the best I could do. <coughs> I think other people might have done a lot better job of coming up with a graphic. Now, I like to, well, I'm a retired military, and one of the first things they taught me in the military was, you want to teach something. First you tell them, then you tell them what you're going to tell them. Uh, first you tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them, then you tell them what you're going to tell them. So, you beat a dead horse. <clears throat> so let's talk about carbon sequestration, but let's go all the way back to volume and see how we follow one tree, how we might see that tree at different stages of its life. So I'm going to choose the Jake Swamp White Pine, which is, so far as we know, the tallest accurately measuring living thing in New England. Do I know that for sure? Of course, I cannot know that unless I see every tree, but I get lots of tips. I go, I measure trees in Maine, I measure in New Hampshire, I measure in all over the eastern United States. We're fanatics, folks. We're absolutely <laughs> obsessed people. <laughs> and these two guys are more obsessed than I am. <laughs> so we measured back this tree when Jack Sobin and I, he's a timber framer and a, an architect, world famous timber framer. Uh, goes to Japan, goes to Australia, goes to England. But he was also a big tree hunter and he owned a transit. So we measured Jake Swamp using cross triangulation back in 1992, accurate about an inch, inch and a half. Jake was 155 feet there. We know right how much it was. Today we know right how much it is. Grew 20 feet in those years. In height, it also grew from 9.6 feet in circumference to 10.8. And it changed its form 
from somewhat more conical to, to more parallel in shape. And notice here, this is me there. I haven't even gotten into the foliage on this. This is trunk below the foliage. It's really not easy to get the full scale of this. If you get far enough back and then the person sort of disappears below. But this is in Massachusetts. It's not somewhere else. Why does it, why, do, why don't more people know about this tree? That's a story that I won't get into here. Some people don't want us to know about stuff like that because it kind of screws up their story about what these trees are. So now let's go back and here, and look at this. This is a very important table. And again, I'm going to get disciplined when I get home because I said I wouldn't dwell on these figures. But I'm not going on a little. Here's 50 years. And that's about the maximum amount of volume in that trunk for the Jake Swamp tree that I can come up with. And I'm not going to tell you how I would do that, I, because we've measured a lot of trees in 50 years. We know what, what's fast growth, what's super fast growth. We know that that would be remarkable if Jake had that much wood in it 50 years, because Jake was growing in a stand with a lot of competition. Okay. Project it out, look at that. Average volume gain, 2.6 cubic feet per year during that first 50 years. Now I took it from a little seedling and projected its volume gain. I could have gone to infinity if I wanted to consider it almost a seed, almost. But you can see the volume gain as a percentage is just gigantic. Because you're going from nothing to that. Then from 50 to 100 years, again, we go out and we look at trees that are 100 years old, roughly. We measure a lot of them. We figure out what's really good growing for a tree in a stand, white pine. And that's about as much as we're likely to see in a 100-year-old white pine growing in a stand. So we say, OK, Jake made it to 322 cubic feet in 100 years. And that meant that he gained 192 cubes in that second 50-year period, whereas in the first 50-year period, it had only 130. So that was an average gain in that period of 3.8 cubic feet per year between, again, 50 and 100. We've measured in this period, so in 150 years, we pretty well knew what the Jake tree had achieved, and it was 605 cubes. So it jumped from 192 to 283, and now it's gaining volume at the rate of 5.7 cubic feet per year during that period of time. Well, that number's bigger than that. That number is bigger than that. The last 10 years, so this only represents 10 years, Jake's up to 666. And if it continued at that rate for another 50 years, it would be, oh, well over 300 cubes gained during that particular 50-year period. Currently, it's putting on about six cubic feet per year. Okay, here's the takeaway. If you look at that, it looks like the tree isn't doing much. It's kind of sitting there, starting to get senescent. The growth rate is slowed down because you're doing it on a percentage basis. But if you do it on an actual volume gain, it's continuing to go up. Why did it take the wood products people so long to understand that. Well, it's taking longer because they still don't understand it. Well, well, I, excuse me, I had a question on that previous slide. Sure. If you were to continue that, or maybe you'll get to it eventually, but if, when, would, when would the average volume gain uh, cubic feet per year start to taper off? I mean, at some point in the trees. Well, it's probably like, pretty close to that. So at, at, toward the end. So Somewhere the, between 150 and 200 years, I expect to see most of these white pines and got to spe species, species specific. Okay. It would start to slow down. It's it's in its glory right now. Okay. And in fact, it may have surpassed its glory because it's got a needle cast fungus, and that's going to slow its growth rate down. But bear in mind that. One of the reasons it's doing as well in here is it has less competition. Through the years, some of those earlier pies that were in there, they've gone. They're not there anymore, so it's got a little more growing space. That happens in these white pine stands. They get older, they thin out, and what you've got left 
takes off like a rocket. I wanted to emphasize something that I think happens when a lot of people don't understand why you've got so much more wood in the older trees than in the young ones. All right, let's take a tree that's, let's say, pretty young, and it's made 100, one cubic foot. Figure that out. And it's growing pretty fast. It goes to one and a half cubic feet, and that's 150% gain in volume, you know, 150% of the, the original number, of the original base. You can do that a number of ways, of course. <clears throat> At 500 cubic feet, let's say it's slowed down to, to considerably, to a one and a half percent volume increase in that year. You're talking about the, the year, and that's seven and a half cubes. So, a large percentage increase on a very small volume usually isn't anywhere near as much as a very small percentage increase on a very large volume. I think a lot of people get confused on that point. And therefore, they really don't see these trees as growing. But there's another reason, and I'll share this with you. Let's say that we have a tree that's 40 inches in diameter and 100 feet in height. And it's getting up there in years. So on the following year, it grows <clears throat> one tenth of an inch by radius. The radius increases one tenth of an inch. So you got the radius on this side of the center line, radius on that side. So the diameter would have increased two tenths, two tenths of an inch. At the end of the year, the diameter would be 40.2 inches, starting at 40. Who's going to see that? <laughs> Who's going, to, who's going to recognize that growth? Yeah. Let's say it was 100 feet tall. It grows to 100 and a half, 100.5 feet. How many people can look at that and say, oh, I, that tree grew half a foot? No, they don't recognize that. So commercially, basically, in terms of the economic value of the tree, they're absolutely 100% right. They know what they're doing there. The tree isn't gaining value from such a small growth. Of course, the trunk is not, the, the wood is being put on through the entire tree. The limbs are getting thicker, everything's there. And it's a function of how much leaf area you've got. Got a big tree, got a lot of leaf area, it's gonna put on wood, but it's gonna put on this little thin cone of wood coming from the top down. And that adds up to a lot more than you would think if you were just looking at the tree. Now, I have to throw this in because I've been photographed a lot. That's not my best side. <laughs> we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> so one of the things in American forests, they keep the National Register of Big Trees for the whole country. And uh, they asked me and my friend, retired, uh, Forest Service forester Don Berglet from Alaska. He was the research forester at the Grand Canyon. Good guy. I knew him a long time. He said, we, we convinced him that there are three pages, internet pages of how you measure a tree, just wasn't hacking it. He said, okay, then you guys do it. Well, when we got through, we had 86 fun hack pages telling you everything you don't want to know about measuring trees by putting you to sleep. I think I would probably be hung by a lot of tree measures because I took all the fun out of it. I made it into this. And they paid me back by photographing me from my good side. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> summary. What do we take? What, what, what do we come from? through? What do we learn? Large trees obviously hold more carbon than smaller ones. That's a no-brainer. Everybody can see that. But trees 20 to 50 year old do not sequester carbon at higher rates than the larger trees, just as you see. Unless you want to put it on that silly percentage basis that doesn't tell you much of anything. Large, older trees sequester carbon, more carbon on an annual basis than smaller, younger trees. That's a very important takeaway because most information that comes through the popular sources 
give you the impression that that's not true. You'd be better off by them by rotating your tree crop every 50 years. That's not the way to do it. If you want to sequester carbon, you might have a lot of other reasons for doing it. I wouldn't pass judgment on that. I'm just looking at it from this standpoint. Broad averages don't mean too much. You know, we go back to the 48 pounds. No, your trees are probably doing a lot better than that. The individual <clears throat> dimensions and volumes of young trees increase faster on a percentage basis, what I just said, than the larger trees. But the percentage level view has led to mis understanding on absolute growth rates. That's what the people out there in Andrew's experimental forest were, were telling us. That's what a lot of other people, and some of them I know and, and have worked with a couple of them in uh, Costa Rica and Central America, they're trying to get better methods for measuring tree growth in the tropics. And a lot of this is really new, but it's true. <laughs> okay, that's the summary of the stuff. Conclusion. If you want to increase carbon sequestration to help mitigate global warming, encourage the growth of older forests with bigger trees. So that's it. Barbara. I was just wondering whether there was, what unit there was for um, a set of trees a, and then looking at the interaction. I know there are lots of people who study the interactions of trees, so I was wondering what the older trees might have as a biochemical effect on their neighbors? Well, there's a lot of that. that. That gets really, really complicated in terms of how trees compete with one another, but they also cooperate with one yeah. another. And a lot of the modern stuff is really allowing us to understand that it is truly a community. Mm -hmm. And that I think early on, timber folks saw it totally as competition. They did not believe that there was cooperation. And that's what some of these later scientists are really showing us. And, and I don't want to take this too far. I, you know, if you've got a, a tree that's being attacked by the emerald ash borer, you, you're not going to not take it down. You're not going to not try to control problems. So there are always situations where you would certainly thin out, cut, or whatnot. I'm not trying to say that this is a license to say, don't ever cut a tree. That's ridiculous. Of course not. But the point is that the older, larger trees do sequester carbon at a greater rate. And so if you've got a good mix of that, then that's the way to do it. Oh, David, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm going to ask another question, but you might want to get to that later. OK, now, from a management standpoint, you know, we all have houses with Made of wood, probably. Uh, tables made of wood, etc. Love wood. We're not going to set all of our land aside and just let it turn into old growth forests. So, are there visions of how we up the sequestration and also manage? I like Harvard Forest Solution of the uh, through my friend David Foster, uh, Wildlands and Woodlands all the way back to 2005, I think, roughly somewhere in there. But he offers a vision, and it comes out that you have wildlands, and you leave them alone, basically. Unless you have to do some mitigation because of, you know, some pest that's gotten into the sta a stand of trees or something. I think he uh, suggests about 10% of the forest area in that. Maybe you think that's a little light, maybe not. But at least he's got a plan there. Now, here's another one that I came up on just very recently. You can see that. Proceeding from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And, and, and uh, this was a couple of scientists. One of them was at Oregon State University, and one of them was at the University of Idaho. And they wanted to think about for Oregon, how can Oregon get involved in helping mitigate climate change through carbon sequestration? And here's what they came up with. In other words, if you've got a private land and you're growing, uh, growing Douglas fir that can live to 800 years, you really don't want to cut them in 45 years. 
let them grow a little longer because it'll add a lot more wood. So they're recognizing politically you're not going to go too long and up the stand rotation period from what it is on private land in Oregon from 45 to at least 80 years. I suspect they'd like it to go further than that, but political climate. And reduce the amount of harvesting on federal lands or in, well, that's a no-brainer. It ain't going that way now, you know. <laughs> that's what we uh, conclude. Now, Monica wanted me to say, well, you know, you're going to, if, if any eyeballs are not spinning from all this stuff, I mean, is it all about carbon sequestration? If don't we have other values to think about? And we went back and we looked at our sage from Concord, Henry David Thoreau, and what he saw as a good idea. Each town should have a park, or rather a primitive forest of 500,000 acres or 1,000 acres where a stick should never be cut, a common possession forever. And later in Walden, 1854, we can never have enough of nature. We must be refreshed by sight of an inexhaustible, bigger, past and titanic form. Features the wilderness with its living and its decaying trees. So although I live for these purposes in my engineering garb, all my trees in the back are named. There's Oki, Doki, Pokey, <laughs> Little Pokey, Smokey, and Pokemon. There's Monica's Tulip, Monica's Pine. Monica's got a lot of trees. Kiara's <laughs> tree. So the feeling, the feeling that we have for these great beings that allow us to have life is... Now... I have a video. Yeah. Ray, I wanted Ray, if Ray could show us just in a short video a scan from not so much carbon sequestration to a lot. Uh, we've got a little short video. And Casey is going to do that for us. And here it's going to come up momentarily, and, and then I'll tell you something else. <clears throat> No. Meadow, a little bit, but not much. So here's an open meadow. Forget those trees back there. <laughs> then you got a little more stuff growing and starting, but there's still not very much carbon there. Now this is where a lot of people get food. They think because there's a lot of greenery at eye level that catches your, your view that that represents a lot of carbon. No. <clears throat> And then you get the very dense thickets of trees that they believe are growing real fast, and they are percentage-wise a little older. But now we're picking up wood. We're really getting volume, more volume. It's starting because these trees are growing rapidly. And here we've got a beautiful tree. Right, do you remember? Mount Greylock, it said. Oh, yeah, Mount Greylock, I'm yeah. sorry. He labeled it. Yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry. Right. So, Ray went in and he took a lot of video. And, and then, we're showing you the vertical scale. I mean, there's so much wood that goes so far up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you get the idea that one tree counts a lot when they get to that size. The 500 year old black gums. And then one of our favorite places, the Bryant Homestead, White Pines and Walk Trail State Forest. Mm -hmm. Just a nice red maple there that uh, kept on growing. Hemlocks and Bryant. These are 250 to 275 year old trees. A few of them might be over 300. And then the glory of the place, the great whites, mm -hmm. New England's flagship tree. There's 20 of them in Bryant that make 150 feet, with Bryant Pine at 164 the last time we measured. 
Okay. And now can you click on your mark? Yeah. I'm going to leave you with a slide that, uh, you know, again, Ray did this. And by the way, just to let you know, Ray and Jerry and, you know, a bunch of us made a film on Old Grove Forest. And uh, it runs 56 minutes. And we'll hopefully be able to show it around. Uh, all of our scientist friends that were part of all this are in it, like David Foster has a big role. So that's the bright white pines, the wall of wood. I think I've said about everything, uh, so I appreciate very much. If there are questions, do we have time? Sure. Yeah. Okay, David. I'm going to give you a hand.